Uh, hi everybody, welcome to uh, another episode of Designer and Developer Having Coffee. Today is a special episode because it's our first episode ever hosting a guest. Uh, my name is Tom, I'm a designer in this duo. And a quick random fact about me is that I know all of the episodes of Friends by Memory, which is uh, very specific, I know, and but don't test me on a Friends trivia quiz because I'm going to destroy you. I was just about to say, not very specific, but very sad. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm the enthusiastic developer in the duo, Mario. And the random fact about me is that I actually have a new haircut. I look like a normal person, finally. Uh, but I am going to hide it with the hat because I figured out that I had this cool hat. It was bought by my mother-in-law. She brought it from Australia. It's original. It's beautiful. And I don't really have a chance to wear it ever. So I decided I'm going to be wearing it for the podcast. So here we are. This is a especially interesting random fact for those of you who are listening to the audio version because you cannot hear or see any of this. Well, they can hear, they cannot see. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy that you hear how I'm wearing you... a hat. It probably sounds yeah. nice. <laughs> uh, I want to say welcome to James, uh, James Brown. Uh, James is a friend of mine. We, he's a, we met as uh, when James was a product owner, but James is also a... Uh, full stack developer, more or less. James, you correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we met in 2019. We worked together, and I'm very excited to have you on the show. Tell us a little bit about your James, self, James, and tell us a random fact about you too. Yeah, I I have been. I've never been a product owner. I've never been a product owner. That's never been my job title. I suppose I've done no? that. No, no product, sorry, product manager, Pro- head of head of product was the title. Head of product. Or just you know, it's uh it's a bone of contention when it comes to product managers. They don't really want to be called product owners or project managers is the other one, but you know. What is the difference between a product owner and product manager? So a product owner is a role in Scrum, essentially. And a product manager is kind of a larger role that sometimes encompasses that role in Scrum. And the problem with the role in Scrum is that it brings with it all of the, you know, the modern agile baggage that is sometimes useful, but a lot of times not very useful. So okay. I'm go. correcting myself. James was a head of product <laughs> when we worked together. James was actually uh, a sorry soul that hired me. So, and now a couple of years later, we are still friends. And I'm going to use this opportunity, James, to apologize for all the bad jokes in previous <laughs> five or so years. No, so, so many, so many stay, good jokes. Not, yeah, it's not a couple of years later. It's a couple of thousand dollars of therapy later. Uh, yeah, and it's more than two years, dude. We're, we're, oh, we're forgetting four, about the pandemic. Yeah, yeah four, four years. Four something years, like uh, that. 2019. So, yeah, four, mm-hmm. four years. Anyway, uh, James, tell us, tell us a little bit about what you do at the moment. I know that you are currently building a software. So yep. uh, you went from head of product into... Uh, building your own app. Tell us a little bit about your the app and then we can talk about how the stuff works. Yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of... <laughs> I've just redone my LinkedIn profile. I, I, I'm going through a, a, um, a phase of like prospecting for customers to speak to, like prospective customers to speak to. And uh, <laughs> it, it's an app for marketers. And the first marketer I spoke to was like, you, you want to speak to marketers, you really, really need to sort your LinkedIn profile out because it's very bad. And it was bad. I had a very typical developer, developer to LinkedIn profile. So um, I've been calling myself a product and technology consultant, which kind of is code for, I used to be a developer, so I know a lot about technology. And uh, more recently I've been doing product management and also kind of indie indie hacking on my own thing. The app that I'm currently working on is called Sparkdraft. It's for marketers and it's in the sort of content performance, content feedback space. So essentially for content marketers, allowing them to gather feedback about the content that they publish, essentially, so that they can measure its performance. Okay. Full stop. That's that's nice. that's interesting. Before we we can have another conversation once you launch your product, and then uh, yeah, we can we'll definitely share it. But since uh, you've been a uh, head of product, and this is a designer and developer podcast, uh, I want to have a conversation that use this opportunity where 
how you as a head of product see the roadmap coming together and how does your conversation between design and development look like and keeping in mind that we i know have some listeners who are not aware of how does software come together from a like a company perspective like what does it take for a business to build a software i would like to you to tell us a bit more about that from your perspective so how how a roadmap for a, for a new product comes together yes <clears throat> so okay so the classic product manager response is it depends depends on the context where you are are you in are you in an enterprise are you essentially one part of a one small part of a very large business or are you a small company where your product is in effect the whole the whole business but you you kind of need to start at the um you know, you start with the, the strategy, um, the product strategy, which if you're in a small business is kind of the same as the business strategy. And um, that strategy informs, um, you know, what your, uh, the kind of change you're going to make in the world, what is the, um, what's the thing that you've spotted, the, the need that you've spotted that you, you're going to build a solution for and how precisely you're going to do it. And then, um, you go out, you ideate, you come up with ideas, you speak to customers, find out um, whether they really have the needs that you've identified and whether they really need the, the solutions that you've thought about. And then you basically end up with a whole bunch of potential opportunities and avenues that you can pursue. Uh, and then um, you prioritize them turn them into something that looks like it could be uh, a product and then that kind of becomes uh, that kind of becomes the roadmap essentially okay so what is the difference between talking about the roadmap or whatever you come up with with stakeholders versus mm -hmm. your team your designers and developers how do you is there a difference and if it is what is the difference yeah there is, there is a difference the roadmap is uh, uh so it's essentially it's um it's like a political document. It's um, <laughs> it's a tract. So for, for stakeholders, it's um, it gives people an idea of the direction that you're going. Um, there are things on the roadmap that might not might never happen, um, but it's uh, it's a materialization. It's one step on the materialization from from idea sort of initiative to the to the finished article. So. So an ideal roadmap, you'll have essentially the things that you're going to build in the next little while, and they are definitely going to happen. Then you'll have like a midterm view of the of directions you're going to go. Then you'll have a, a long term view of these are the things that, that that might might kind of happen. And when you're talking to leadership about that roadmap, you're essentially communicating. You're essentially you're essentially communicating what you're working on right now and the the general direction that they want to know. And when you're talking to team, it's more about more about letting them know what they're working on right now and giving them an idea of the sort of the why and the general strategy. I think it's just, you know, the message changes slightly depending on who you're who you're speaking to. But if I may, I would assume that this has to be sort of an iterative process. Like you would talk, I don't know, first you talk to the stakeholders and to, to the leadership of the company and you decide, okay, this would be really nice to have. This is a strategy. This is where we're going to go. But then you have to go to operations and then the operations are going to tell you, for example, okay, this is something we cannot do. Or this is something yeah. that you envisioned it really nicely, but it's going to take us not two weeks, but like two years go back and tell them so it has to in my opinion it should be like an either an iterative process where you as a head of product get bounced back like a ping pong ball between the two or in an ideal world it would be a joint effort where you would have uh, uh, people from development people from design people from marketing people from sales people from leadership and you as a head product uh, kind of joining it all together in one meeting or in one series of sessions where you would then decide on a roadmap yeah, it's really it's really contentious. It's an evolving document, right? So they'll be 
um, if you're in a sales-led organization, there'll be uh, salespeople coming to you or the CEO coming to you and saying, look, we need to close this big deal. You need to build this, uh, this, big, this big thing that needs to be on the roadmap. And it may or may not fit into your current strategy and direction. And then, then, you, then it's your, then it's, that's where it's a political document because you have to, you have to work out, is this going to fit in? Can it fit in? Um, if we make this commitment, what does the, um, uh, what does that mean for everything else? Um, this is dude, Marty Kagan is one of the big influencers in the product world. And he talks about having, um, Oh, I can't remember exactly what he says, but he talks about having uh, a roadmap, having a few high, um, um, high integrity commitments. Like you, obviously, you know, the world is the way it is. Um, if you're working with marketing, marketing may need, may need to plan a launch and that launch may include buying, um, you know, buying space in publications or buying a stall at um, a large a large event that co costs tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars um, and that has a hard date so if you if you need to release something for that date then that's that's a that's a high integrity commitment that you need to make but if you make too many of those commitments then you're going to you're going to blow through some of them so you need to be to be careful about what you, about what you do so yeah there'll be some of these commitments that are you're definitely going to make and the others are kind of directional again informed by the strategy and yes, it's, it, it's, it's, it's iterative. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's the other, the other key thing about a roadmap that's, um, important to realize is that a roadmap isn't, isn't a plan. It's not a plan and it's definitely not a release plan for your software. So it isn't a list of features and dates. And so what you'll often get from a stakeholder is you'll share a roadmap and it'll be like kind of a bit like a Gantt chart and it'll look a bit vague and the, um, the stakeholder will, who may have a business or a financial background will look at that and say, could you give that to me as a spreadsheet with line items and dates on it? What they want is, is a plan and it, they want a high integrity commitment for every item. But that's, it's really important to note that these are, these are completely different documents. The, the roadmap is about a statement of intent. This is the direction that we're going and things may change apart from those very few things that we've agreed that we're definitely going to do. And then the plan, the release plan is, is something completely different. And that's more delivery than, than sort of management and direction. Of course, the things blur into each other um, in the end, um, but they are separate. Uh, so... With all of that, if it if the the if the roadmap is kind of intent, where do actual resources and budgets come into play? Like, you know, I want to build a spaceship. First, I want to build an ignition engine, but I have two students who have barely held a wrench in their life, and I have three wrenches. How do I do that? <laughs> when does when does uh, uh, resources and and uh, uh, budgeting and time come into play? Hmm. Well, it's kind of a separate, it's fun. That's kind of a separate conversation, isn't it? You know, you either, and how do you, you're veering off into how do we, how do we fund a product? How do we fund a project? Are we running a project? Are we running a product? Are we funding this, the value stream? Are we funding a thing to be built or are we funding um, an effort towards achieving an outcome? So, you know, you could say, um, okay, CEO says we need to build an app. The app needs to do roughly these features. Um, and then as a product manager or a product owner or whatever, you could come up with your list of features and say, here's, here's how we're going to, this is my roadmap. This is how we're going to build this thing. And um, then you would assign, you know, resource to that. That would cost X amount and that would be budgeting. But that's kind of more like a, a, a project. When you want to look at it as a, as a product, it would be more like the CEO will say, oh, we need an app to do this thing. And the product manager will go back to the CEO. And, and as if you were a consultant working for a client, you try and dig under the skin of what they're asking for and work out what really is the thing that, what really is the change that they're trying to make? What really is the thing that they're looking to achieve? Um, it's an app that does this thing, but actually it came from a conversation that he had or... Uh, or she had 
um, uh, around the state of the, the market and they spotted an opportunity. They had this business strategy thing going on. Um, but they've expressed that in the form of we need an app. If you can get back to that strategy goal, then you can express the um, express what needs to be done in the form of, OK, as a company, we need to achieve this thing in the market. Um, we need to address this pain point that a certain segment of our customers have. And then we're going to put this amount of money down on doing that. This is this amount of money uh, is what we think this opportunity is worth. And then um, you set out your roadmap with the with the things uh, first you think are a easiest to achieve that will achieve the highest impact. And then you run off down that road, implementing those things and getting them to market as you know, as soon as you as soon as you can uh, towards that goal. So you're kind of funding a value stream rather than funding funding a project I've rambled a bit there but does that kind of make sense to you it does and by the way you've opened up so many topics that i think you've just invited yourself to several other shows that are going to come <laughs> in the future. so thanks for that <laughs> my pleasure what do you do in your companies when you fund do you funding projects are you what's your budgeting process look like it's different for everyone so if you're asking me, uh, one of the companies that I run is a development company and uh, we either have we have two types of projects. Either we say, OK, this is our price per hour and then we're just, you know, uh, uh, billing by the hour. That's the easiest, that's the safest and that's uh, uh, OK. But A, on one side, people want to get, you know, this is a plan to commit to a plan, commit to a budget and commit to a time. And this is always difficult. It's not difficult to commit to a budget or to commit to uh, a deadline. It's difficult for both sides to commit to the same uh, uh, feature list. Mm -hmm. And you can write, I'm really good at writing specifications. I'm really good at covering edge cases. I'm really good at asking, but what's going to happen if this happens? Do we need to cover that and all of that? And I tend to write really, really good specification documents. But there is no way that you can cover a software that takes, I don't know, six months to build with a spec document. There's just no physical way. It cannot be done. I mean, it will take you three of those six months to, to, to write a full spec if you want to do it that way. This is why people have moved to Agile. This is why people are working uh, uh, by the hour and things like that, which makes perfect sense. But a general roadmap in the beginning uh, uh, makes sense. So you, get, you do get like a general roadmap, this is what we want to do, this is roughly how we're going to do it. Here we're going to have, I don't know, user management. We're not going to write out user management into all detail, but you know, we'll say, okay, you can do this, you can do that, da, 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 da. We don't have to write exact forms. And then in the end, uh, you kind of hope that you're working with uh, uh, clients that understand that if they drill you around every single checkbox, can that be five pixels down? Can that be five pixels up? And if you wait, if you waste two months on moving the, you know, checkbox up and down, that that's not really cool. And uh, we actually had an episode where we talk about red flags with clients. Clients that have that type of attitude should be red flag clients. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, generally we, uh, uh, based on experience, I have a good estimate on how much things are gonna could take and actually Tom this could be an episode uh, of its own but I'm gonna share just quickly how I do some estimations so I set out a task list in order to do this these are the features that we need I don't know if it's a to-do app we need user management we need to do items they need to have CRUD operations we need a database we need to set up the project we need to set up the repo we need to set up the continuous integration and all of that we need to and things like that for each of these, it can take a minimum of one man day, a maximum of three man days. The second one can take a minimum of two man days, a maximum of five man days. And then I get a sum of minimum and maximum man days. And this sum is like really, really, really broad. So I don't know. I could see that this project takes anywhere from uh, 40 to 120 man days. If everything goes wrong, it's going to take 120. If everything goes right, it's going to take 40. But obviously, that's not a estimate that's a you know too wide so i take the middle i add 15 plus minus 15 percent and that's my estimate on mm -hmm. top of that you usually have like at least 20 to 25 percent of q a 
you have at least 20 to 25 percent of scope creep because scope creep is going to happen whether you've specified it to the end or not and you have roughly 20 to 25 percent project management when you add in those you get the actual time that it's going to take to build an actual software plus minus and then you can again uh, sum it in the middle and add plus minus 15 percent and so far that methodology has been okay for me I've gotten some great estimates, but that's how you do, that's how we do the estimates and the budgeting based on it. Mm -hmm. So it's project, essentially project by project. Project by project, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, is that you are, if you think about where you are in the, you know, the value chain of, of, of what's going on you're you're kind of you're positioned let's say around here where you're talking about the the output of what you're what you're doing but you're not really talking about um the the out the outcome the thing that the company that's hiring to do you to do this development wants to happen essentially so it's uh there's this slider about consultancies always want to move up the value chain right because there's more money and fun for people like us i think uh f further up that's just the that's just the truth of it but there is something about there is this idea that if you can move up that value chain and get the technical people and the business people all all in the same room on the same side and not divided by a contract boundary which is what you're describing then there's this idea that magic happens when you have an empowered team like that. So what you've just described about an estimate and a specification and all of that detail, I've been, I've done lots of consultancy <clears throat> technical stuff in, in the past. I've fallen foul of my own awful estimates and had to, uh, you know, had to have put a lot of late nights and uh, swallow the cost of, of bad estimates in, in, in the past. Um, but that's all about, there's a contract boundary between the, the business the, that's commissioning the software and the people, you know, developing the software. If you can erase that contract boundary and have everyone in the same room and the, the team of, let's say, a two pizza team of 10 people um, all chasing the same goal and not having to spend all of that wasted effort on estimating and punishing each other for missing deadlines, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then... Perhaps that's where the magic happens. So as an agency or a consultancy, you know, is there a way? I know that there are agencies that kind of try to work in a more, quote, agile way to, to, to move a little bit, to not necessarily move a bit further up the value chain. Yes, that, but also to reduce the impact of that, of that contract boundary, reduce the sort of punitive in, impact on the on the project not that i'm saying that you or your company or your you know are being ineffective because a lot of the time there's um that's what's called for you know essentially we, we need some software we know what it's what it is and we need to get somebody to build it for us uh so very often it happens to to at least to me and tom you can also share your experience but we i usually say okay we can come in as your team on this project we have this is where we want to go but we will go agile we will have team meetings we'll decide on the priorities and we will be building them like week by week or a couple of weeks by a couple of weeks depending on how you define but we are going to work with you we are going to work in the best interest of your time and your product and uh, we'll be building by the hour and with some companies that works because they understand exactly what you just said that by doing this they've erased the contractual uh, boundary and they are leveraging most of our time other companies have an obligation to make it guys it's really nice that you're offering that but i can't go to my board and then they go to their board and then they go to their board then 76 boards up somebody has to approve on a budget i need a budget and people don't want to take the risk of saying okay i'm gonna say to my board that this is not going to go over, I don't know, 100 pieces of stone, but I am going to be paying you by the hour to leverage your time best, and I'm going to be in charge of making sure that that happens. And I assume that this is something that your role as head of product would also possibly uh, uh, touch base on, 
but uh, uh, in general, if you have the confidence from the client to, that you are going to be working with them in the best interest, then I think it's best for them to hire you on an hourly basis, literally to reduce all of the all of the contractual issues and all of the things. What if this happens and so on? Yeah, because that's not productive time. So based on that, here's a question for both of you. Um, I think I mentioned this in one of the previous episodes. I just I think it bears repeating, and that's uh, we. I know you both, so I know this is true. Tend to be as honest as possible with a client telling them like this is the amount of effort it will take and from based on experience this type of software takes three months to build six months to build whatever months to build and it we with that in mind with the resources we have it's going to cost you x it's going to be one designer three developers whatever 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 and then i've seen numerous time happen where client would say like oh we have an offer from company x y and z who said it's going to be done in one time in one month not in three months so we're going to side with them because time is money and we need that sooner rather than later but that other company knowing full and well that either knowing or being delusional they're going to deliver they do not deliver but after one month they locked in a client now you can't leave because you already invested one month of work one month of you pay for the people you already have some code in so you now have nothing else to do but wait for them to deliver and they usually then deliver later on probably in the same time or even worse how to approach clients and explain to them that uh something is unrealistic and how to gain trust from them that you are actually not trying to screw them over on yeah. the price i think there's a uh, there's a slider isn't there of high trust and low trust environments and low, if you're in a if you're a client in a low trust environment, then then you'd be very foolish to to accept an agile um, an agile contract. You should you should make sure that you have, you you lock down exactly what's going to be delivered and what's uh, what's the price. Uh, and then in in a high trust high trust environment, um, you can do this sort of time and material sprint by sprint type relationship. Now on how do you deal with a client who who wants to who wants to go with the cheaper bids i think i think you can have a crack at telling them that they're making a mistake um but if you don't already have that high trust relationship with them they're probably just not the right client for you 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 have to move on and find a different client i didn't i didn't listen to your red flag clients episode but it's a it's a giant red flag <laughs> if they've gone off and said, you know, my mate's cousin can do it for in one month. You you can't and you don't want to compete with that and you just mustn't. Yeah, absolutely. The, we have a we have a saying uh, in creation that that goes like, uh, if somebody can do it cheaper, it's probably the neighbor's kid. Neighbor's kid has a computer. Neighbor's kid going to fix it, right? Uh, but we are not talking about neighbors' kids. We are talking about companies that full-on mislead clients, right? Yeah. So yeah. So I have a I have a thing here. Two things actually that I want to say. The first thing that I've learned through experience is, if we want to, you know, negotiate, I can negotiate with you on the price. So if I say this is going to take me, I don't know, two to three months, and it's going to cost between. 100 and 300 uh, uh, I don't know uh, pieces of bacon then you can say wow that's too much and then I can say okay for you my friend I can lower it to 80 to 200 pieces of bacon but if I tell you that something is gonna take me two months and then you say wow can you do it faster I can't come back and say yeah I can do it in a month for two reasons first of all that means that I have literally admitted that I tried to swindle you the first time. And uh, uh, second of all, it won't. I cannot make up a month. There is no way I can make up a month, you know. And if you tell me, uh, I don't know, but I need really urgently, I can say for a shorter project, okay, we're going to work day night. You're going to pay triple. And we are going to put it in like two man days into one man day. I'm going to say to my family, hey, guys, I'm out. I'm going to be back in a week. I won't sleep. That's doable. But that's going to cost you like three times extra. 
which is fine, but it's still not shortening the time. It's shortening the calendar time, but the, the time effort is still like 20 man days or 50 man days, and you cannot go around it. And the second thing that I actually heard that a friend of mine did, uh, Toma Pokrajic, if you're listening to this, shout out. Uh, he had a guy who came into his office and said, well, the other company says they can do it for this much. And uh, Toma looked at him in the eye and said, so why are you sitting here? <laughs> and the guy was like really puzzled. Well, if they told you that they're going to do it in X and you know that I'm going to do it in 2X and you came to this meeting today, why are we in this meeting today? Either you are not you yourself don't truly believe that they can do it in X or you truly believe that I'm your man and you need to pay 2X. For either of those reasons, you came into this room today and we are now drinking coffee and discussing this possible job. So think about why you actually came to this office. And I like that so much in theory. I like it as an anecdote. It will sound really cool in the podcast. I don't know if I would have the balls to actually do it on an actual sales meeting. I haven't had the chance to try since I've heard about it. But if I do decide to do it, you're going to hear about it here. So, uh, uh, yeah. Happy Why wouldn't you have the balls? Why not? It's like if you're going to lose the client either way, then you might as well have a like have the attitude where I'm either your guy or I'm not your guy. If I am your guy, great. If I'm not your, also great, I'm going to find another client. All of the ratio is on your side. I just don't know if I would actually have the balls to look a person in the eye and say, okay, but so why are we here? That's kind of brutal. But it's not the balls. It's just the curiosity. Like, why are you here? Like, I would really like to know the answer. Like, I'm not, I'm not being a jerk. I'm trying to figure out, like, if you have a better offer, why did you come here? Like, what is the, what is driving you? If you want, yes, they're they're there because they're there because they want to work with you, but they want to work with you at the price of the other, of the other firm. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, I, I would like to drive a Ferrari on it at a price of a Nissan Juke, but it just doesn't work like that. Yeah, exactly. So I think in that, in that situation, you have, to, you have to say, what is it that we both, what is it that we all want? We all want to, or what is it that you really want? They really want the success that they think the thing that you're going to build is going to bring them. And then you, you, it's not about price then, it's about, it's about that, it's about that success. <laughs> Maybe you, if they tell me, you have oh, that we conversation. Just, and maybe they say, oh, we just like you having coffee with you. And then in that case, it's... Uh, well, That's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, we can always have coffee. Yeah. So James, the, the, the head of product position is like more uh, uh, in larger environments, in larger companies. Yeah. Now you're building your own thing where you're probably the UX designer, the developer, the head of product, the support. Yeah, the, well, the, the head of, the head of product kind of position is... Yeah. Uh, so the head of product position was a, so what I was doing at that company was essentially I was in charge of, the, in charge of the product, as in not just doing product management, but also like line managing the engineering team, design team, support, um, having the client relationships, you know, the commercial stuff as well. So I was kind of sort of managing, general managing that, um, I didn't have control of profit and loss for that business. That was that was not ceded to me. But everything else kind of kind of was. So traditionally, in a product management career path, you'd uh, you'd go into some sort of associate product manager role, product management, then uh, product manager role, then senior, uh, then maybe group, then maybe um, uh, maybe like VP product or head of product or director of product management. So director VP. Head of is kind of around there somewhere, and then you're a chief product officer. Um, and as you go up in those roles, your your scope of what you're managing in terms of your product portfolio expands, and also from group product manager onwards, you have some sort of management, pastoral, uh, uh, whatever responsibilities towards other product managers, essentially. And also, you you move further towards strategy and and further away from tactics as you go higher up that higher up that chain now what i was doing was essentially um product managing a single product as part of a portfolio but also doing all this other stuff as well hence the head of title so you know there what you asked was why am i uh, <laughs> why am i now 
how do you after how being you know sort of high up in charge of product now that you're doing your own product you're probably in charge of everything how do you kind of lower yourself down all the way to the you know final details well um do, do you know that actually indie hacking building trying to kickstart your own thing from scratch is very like being in charge of everything to do with a with a product you're you're doing you're not doing everything but everything is in your purview when you have a team um, you can achieve more because many things can be either many tasks can be delegated but also many outcomes can be delegated um, for example on my cv on my cv for the role where i set a product um, it says uh, implemented agile ways of working which um, technically I did um, we I had a uh, an employee who was a delivery manager he didn't start as a delivery manager but um, he became a delivery manager whilst we worked together and um, um, I set him off on a direction to implement agile ways of working and then um, he kind of grew into that direction and that worked really really well um, now of course um, when you're on your own you can't delegate anything, whether it be tasks or, or or outcomes, but you do have to think about all of the same thing. So it's kind of kind of similar in that regard and different to the other things that I do, which are product consulting, tech consulting, which is essentially going to meetings, listening to people's issues and giving them advice or hands on development, which I still do a bit, a bit of for other people. Um, where you're just responsible, you know, you essentially, it's not quite like this, but you essentially pick up a ticket and then you deliver what's on the ticket. So you, your, your purview is much smaller in that, in both of those regards, really. Um, yeah. So I'm, I suppose I'm partially indie hacking because I kind of miss having the, uh, having the entire team and that, and that larger scope of work. Um, yeah, it's so a very similar sort of thing. What is your what is your then biggest challenge being an indie hacker? Well, there are lots of challenges, um, and the challenges change as time goes on. My current challenge is, I think that I, uh, I think that I probably need to pivot my idea slightly, and there is a big challenge of. I have of worrying about sunk cost, shall we say. So I've gone a certain way down a, a certain direction and I have gone through a number of potential target markets and spoken to a lot of people, built a prototype, that sort of thing. And I found a target market that I really like where my solution kind of fits but doesn't quite tick all the boxes. And I think that I need to pivot to tick those boxes and the big challenge for me now is managing the psychology of, okay, so I, I've now done this strategic work or this is an ongoing thing, but now this is where I am in terms of what I think my strategy is. Now I need to get back down, get my head down and start sort of solutionizing and creating prototypes, et cetera, before I can move forward. But psychologically managing what the scale of that work is uh, in the future and my own like personal runway is quite a hard quite a hard challenge I think that's the kind of thing I'd love to have a team for right now I'd love to have the budget for a team for um yeah I think it's the I think it's the head game is the really is the really tough thing yeah but I've I've learned I've learned so much really um I've learned a lot that's very much applicable to um to, to products and product management. I'm really putting my money where my mouth is when it comes to being a person that can um, that can uh, that can create a new product or decide where the best you know the best way to go is because the stakes are so much higher for me. You know, when you're product managing for somebody else's business with the best will in the world, it's just a job, right? You you want to be super successful, but you're but it's not your own. It's not your own thing that you um, that your personality is wrapped up in. Um, uh, so, before we wrap up, I'll ask you one final question. What would be your advice then to people looking to build their own products? 
I think people advise you to go and scratch your own itch. But I think, uh, and people say that, um, you know, ideas are 10 a penny and execution is everything. Well, I I don't actually believe that anymore. (laughs) I think that um, the idea is uh, is really, really important. And it's okay if you, you can scratch your own itch, but you need to get your head above the parapet a little bit more. You need to, you know, you need to have a look around you a little bit more to see the wider context of what's going on. Um, If you're scratching your own itch and you happen to be riding some sort of wave of excitement that's generally happening that you see around you, then yeah, go for it. But if you're scratching your your own itch and you're the only person with that itch, you're you're gonna have a massive, a massive problem. So catch a wave or find a group of people that you really like interacting with and that have expensive problems and speak to those people. Um and take care on which um, ideas that you pursue um, or pursue a lot of ideas, but pursue them and discard them rapidly, you know, kill those darlings as quickly as possible. Um, Discover the underlying assumptions of the thing that you're trying to build or the, the outcome you're trying to get, what needs to be true for this thing to work and devise the absolute cheapest test that will tell you, no, that's not going to work, or yes, that is, this is going to work, essentially, so that you can quickly sift through. What you mustn't do is, as a developer, is just get your head down for six months and build something awesome that nobody wants. I mean, that's ten a penny advice that everyone will give you, but it's really, really true. And it's really easy, even for someone like me, who really should know better, <laughs> to, uh, to fall foul of. I like it's- what you said find a really cheap way of testing it. Just quick, yeah. cheap way of testing an idea. That makes sense. Yeah. And there's so and many ways somebody, that you can do that. As somebody who's actually been a developer, built it, wasted six months with their head down in the code, built it, and then nobody used it, I can completely verify what James said. Mm-hmm. Everybody has to waste time at least once. So yeah. uh, thank you, James, for everything you shared today. It's my pleasure. Very valuable. We'll definitely have you back again at some point. And now before we wrap up, I need your uh, dad joke of the day. Well, yeah, well, so here's the thing with dad jokes is that I am a really, really funny guy. My kids think I am absolutely hilarious, but I don't tend to do jokes. I just do like running, running gags. So instead of telling my own dad joke, I asked my nine year old for a joke. And she gave me this one. I read it down. So after my French lesson, I said to my French teacher, thanks for teaching me what beaucoup means. It means a lot. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Mario. Uh, I read this one as well the other day, but it's uh, great because it's kind of in the mood. So I have to tell jokes like on Zoom calls and everything, and then nobody laughs. Turns out I'm not remotely funny. (laughs) (laughs) i love that one i love that one uh i have one that i found on twitter it says uh what do you call fish with no eyes (laughs) 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 okay that was that was a triple horrible guys thank you for that okay that was Uh, triple horrible thank you thank you everyone for listening watching commenting sharing Uh, thank you james once again and uh we'll see you in the next one thank you bye bye bye